So, Parag, it's really nice to see you again. Thanks for taking the time to participate with us from uh, Likewise. Singapore. an evening in Singapore. So, fantastic to see you. Likewise. Yeah, here we are, other side of the world, but both obsessed with the same uh, critical issues. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, how do you see Asia's uh, recovery from COVID? One of the things that we see is that Asia has, it, I was going to say, hasn't been hit as hard by COVID, but in fact, you could argue that Asia's done a better job of keeping COVID under control. So how do you see um, the recovery and the economic impact you know, compared to Europe and the US? Well, you're right. I mean, I think let's step back and remember that with uh, Asia having, you know, four and a half billion people, so 10 times more people than Europe and uh, even larger uh, factor, greater population in the United States, if all regimes were equal, uh, COVID would have been devastating for Asia. And it certainly originated here in the region and spread first to Asian countries. But the governments did a very good job. Let's attribute it to a couple of things. It's not magical sorcery. Uh, it had a lot to do with the SARS experience. 18 years ago, Asian countries went through this. The governments, the current political leaders, the populations have a direct memory of that experience. So there was no fooling around. But let's also remember something that does directly relate to infrastructure is that you have competent, long-term thinking governments. They're technocratic, they're professional civil services, enjoy the respect of the people, and they give scientifically based guidance to the population. So there was no fooling around. Everyone got uh, you know, into, into gear or slowed down, quarantined, whatever they needed to do. In terms of the economic recovery, what's critical is also that demographic piece because you still have the rapid, uh, you know, the large urban populations, the young populations, populations, the, uh, the the digitization that has been underway for years. So there was a really good rapid transition towards the sort of services economy, remote work, and so on. So I can say, even though Singapore is an outlier, even in amongst wealthy Asian countries in terms of uh, density and efficiency, um, still, I can tell you as someone who's in this time zone and observing all the countries, even the poorest countries um, have done far better than expected. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, you know, one of the things that we we see here is that um, cities, you know, there's a big question around cities, right? You wrote a, a, a famous best-selling book, Connectography, a couple of years ago, where you highlighted the fact in terms of globalization, cities were absolutely critical. One of the things you see here in the US, I think you see it a little bit in Europe, maybe not as much, is that central business districts the rents are already going down. Lease signs are up everywhere. New York is a place that's hard to get into and out of. Uh, the transit systems are in trouble. What, what do you? What? How is? How is your thesis holding up in terms of cities being the the central uh, places for productivity and for creativity uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people look at the current kind of bad luck, if you will, of big cities that have been kind of unwieldy and ungovernable and see it as the end of cities. But let's remember that we shouldn't take the current reigning cities as representative of all cities, past, present and future. People still want to live in urban agglomerations of some size or scale. It just may not be the ones right now. You can envision a future America where more people live in uh, urban centers in Michigan because they will weather climate change better by sheer virtue of their proximity to fresh water and their uh, latitude. Um, right now, we see Michigan as a depopulated state without a good business model, but that's not going to be true 10 or 15 years from now. So we can see the revitalization of some cities. We can also see the rise of new cities, Boise, yeah. Idaho, could be a great thriving population center. So, you know, we should never pretend that the map of the world is static, which is also one of the most fundamental arguments I'm always making in my work, whether we're talking about political boundaries, whether we're talking about which states have power and which ones don't, or which cities are the kind of reigning role model and so forth. And in general, for America, we should never hold all cities to be New York. You know, New York is sweet and nervous in many ways, and what happens to New York is not necessarily going to reflect what happens to other places. And as you know very well, Norm, for a wide range of factors that relate to economic competition and now accelerated by the cost factors of large cities and the COVID issue and remote work and climate change, there has been a resorting of the American population that has been underway since the last financial crisis and now COVID. So this is a constant phenomenon. We should have our eye 
on what is the intersection of the places that have a good economic model, that are climate resilient, that are cost effective and affordable, and that are attracting young people and are building good infrastructure. And that's where we will absolutely see cities and we will see people moving to those cities. Yeah, those are, those are for me, phenomenal points. And, and you know, you're in the, I think, the, the best connected, most thickly connected city in the world, perhaps, Singapore. One of the things that we're seeing here as well is that people, even if they're moving to the countryside temporarily, cities like Charlottesville, they're actually moving there because of connectivity, right? They're, they're, if there wasn't great connectivity, they wouldn't be moving there. So it's, it's fascinating what, you're, what you said. Um, I've got one more question. What do you see as major trends in Asia? Um, not necessarily as those relate to infrastructure, but obviously Asia is building um, everything right now. But over the next 10 years, how do you see Asia evolving? There's a couple of big inflection points in Asia, which uh, you know we really should hone in on each of them. One is geopolitical in Asia that we've taken for granted as being uh, you know hegemonically China dominated is becoming one where other Asian powers are standing up for themselves, and that does relate for, to infrastructure because instead of Belt and Road being the only game in in town, we have Japan, India, even the U.S. together with um, uh, with Australia and others stepping up, the European Union too in a big way. Every Everyone is competing in this marketplace of infrastructure finance to get the best, most concessional terms to their allies, to smaller, weaker partner states in the region so that they don't become totally dominated by China. So the competitive landscape of infrastructure is a manifestation of the new geopolitics. So that's one inflection point. The other is climate change, because, of course, sadly, there is going to be trillions of dollars of stranded assets. Uh, in terms of the infrastructures that have been built, a lot of Asian populations are concentrated in coastal cities. Right. And you know, Asia has by far the largest number of people exposed to the various manifestations of extreme you know, climate change effects of any place in the world. So you see Jakarta thinking about moving its capital city, uh, Vietnam and other countries in Thailand thinking about pulling their populations inland. The same thing has to happen in India. These cities, so much has already been spent, and now the next wave of infrastructure planning is going to be uh, more about you know building inland, building at elevation, lighter footprint, lower rise, distributing populations so you have less congestion. So the next Manila, you know, the suburbs, the new Manila is being built outside of Manila, the new Jakarta being built outside of Jakarta, and we're seeing this across Asian cities. So I think there's some positive momentum. It's going to cost a lot of money, but you know that's what Asians have been building up their uh, their trade surpluses and currency reserves for. That's where the money is going to go for sure in the years ahead. Because again, unlike other parts of the world, the population here is still growing. What's your uh, What's your next book? You've written a number of bestsellers, and they really do help you. You're a futurologist. They really do help you think about the future. What's what's your next book? Well, I've taken on a very small topic uh, for my next book. It's the future of human civilization. <laughs> and uh, specifically, though, as you know, I'm, I'm a geographer at heart. And the book is actually about the future of human geography. What I'm doing is looking at the next 30 years, 10, 20, 30 year kind of the increments, and looking at where you, I can forecast uh, the human population physically residing. In other words, literally, I want to answer the question, where will we all live in 2030, 2040, and 2050 as the world population reaches 9 billion people? Why did we? Why are we there? Is it climate change? Is it political unrest? Is it economic crises? Is it conflicts? Is it late, uh, gender, um, uh, demographic imbalances? All of these factors are constantly. These are the drivers for human migration, and I want to look you know, as accurately as possible. Take the world's youth population today. Uh, most of the human population, more than 50% of humanity, is under the age of 40, and they are the prime candidates to move. So I'm looking at specifically about 4 billion people today. And why is this so important, Norm? Well, the winners and losers, whether it's cities or countries, in the 21st century, for the rest of the 21st century, will be those places that are attracting today's young people to go and live in their countries. And yeah. uh, so that's the question I've set out to answer. That's, that's phenomenal. When, when is that book going to be out? Um, would have been early 2021, were it not for this uh, pesky pest uh, known as uh, COVID. So we're looking at probably mid-2021. 
great. Well, thank you, Parag. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed seeing you again as well. And look forward to seeing you next week as you're going to be our lead off, lead off uh, kickoff uh, keynote speaker at the uh, 13th Global Strategic Infrastructure Leadership Forum. So thank you so much. Can't wait. Thanks so much, Norm.